Good day, YouTubers. I hadn't planned to start this North of Morton Island series until after I had my MFD because one of the main reasons for getting this new equipment is to enhance the videos. I really think it's going to add a new dimension to them, but it's still in the future and I still don't have a delivery date on it. So I thought I'd kick off this series and I can go back over it and recap on some of the things if I get some better footage to put into it. In the meantime, let's have a look at what I got. I haven't fished north of Morton since I had Dancer, and back in those days I used to launch occasionally from Wynnum, but mostly drive up to Bribie and launch from there because it was a shorter run across. And back in those days I was always impatient to get out fishing. Didn't enjoy the trip as much as I do today. But one thing I'll say about this route, this route was generated automatically by an avionics app, just to give you an idea of getting over there, the length and fuel consumption and everything. But when I went over there, we didn't loop south as far over at the Morton End. I'd say we pretty much went straight from where it starts to go south. We pretty much went straight for the tip of Morton from about there. You've got to get down past a really shallow bank that comes almost exposed at a very low tide. But once you're south of that, there's enough water to get across the other banks. And that's what we used to do. I'd have to be out there in a boat to figure it out again. But if in doubt, follow the route that Navionics sets you because that will be safe. In any event, it's about an hour's run out to Yellow Patch and almost an hour and a half out to Hutchinson's. But there's not an enormous fuel usage if you're leaving from Bribey. These days, I don't plan to launch from anywhere other than Cleveland Raby Bay ramps and I enjoy the trip out as much as I enjoy getting out there and fishing. So taking an hour and a half to get up to Yellow Patch from Cleveland doesn't bother me at all. If it's a nice day, I just enjoy the ride cruising along at around 20 knots. From Cleveland, it's nearly two hours out to Hutchinson's, cruising along at 20 knots, and it's about 50 litres of fuel. But again, that's okay. If it's a nice day, I'm enjoying that ride. And 50 litres of fuel would have been a third of a tank with my previous fuel tank, but now that it's sprung a leak and I've had to replace it, I have a 200 litre tank, and that's only a quarter of a tank. I like to use no more than a third on the way out, a third on the way back, and have a third left in the tank when I get back to the ramp. So taking a quarter of a tank to get out there leaves me a bit of room to move around, look for the fish, and still have plenty to get back on. Now these are the marks we're going to look at in this area. There's lots of wrecks in the area. When you take it from that, there's a fairly dangerous area to navigate around, particularly for a larger boat. But Rex holds fish. There's lots of reef up there to hold fish, uh, lots of structure. And there's a lot of areas there without any marks on them that are reefy patches. So I'm going to talk a bit about them as well. You can have a look at them and find your own marks on them. But that's a little bit off in the future. We'll briefly touch on them shortly. Now before we go any further though, I'll just show up these green zones here. There's nothing there that's going to worry you around these marks except for Flinders Reef. Now that used to be one of my favourite fishing spots up in this area before they made it into a green zone. Hutchies is a little bit further out, but if you stop at Flinders and find some fish, there's not much point in going out any further, at least there wasn't. Now there is because you can't fish there. There's also the conservation areas, and they cover a lot more ground, but as a recreational fisherman, they're not going to really impact on you at all. Have a read up on the rules in conservation areas by all means, but there's nothing in the rules that impacts my style of fishing anyway. If you know this area at all, and if you've been up here fishing at all, you're probably saying to yourself, why is he bothering to tell us how long it takes to get to Yellow Patch? Because there's nothing at Yellow Patch that you're going to catch on a fishing line. And you're quite right. However, when we went up there, we'd take these banner crab pots and drop them off Yellow Patch anywhere along that yellow line there. In about, to, say, 6 to 10 metres of water. And then carry on, go out and fish around Flinders or one of the other rocky outcrops out there. And when we come back, pick up the pots and have a nice feed of spanner crabs as well as whatever fish we caught. So going out there, always stopped at Yellow Patch and dropped in the pots. Just be aware now that there is a closed period on spanner crabs where you can't catch them. And that's rapidly approaching. It's the 1st of November to the 15th of December. 
And as far as I can remember, since they brought it in, it's always been those times. But do check each year just to be sure. Now, I'll just mention that the maximum size for the spanner crab nets is one metre by one metre. Mine are one metre by three quarters of a metre because that's a really good size for storing in the boat. If you're getting up that way looking for fish and you like a feed of crabs, really recommend just taking a few minutes to stop by outside Yellow Patch and dropping your nets in out there on the way out to the fishing ground. Now these are my spanner crab pots here. I've had them for years, all hanging along the back of the boat port, ready to go out again someday. They're not normal pots. You can't don't catch spanner crabs with normal pots. You catch them with these flat frames with the mesh stretched over the frame. It's like that. The minimum size for the rod is six millimetre, and the crabs come into it and get their claws caught in the net, and they just stick there, and you pull them up. Get one of those wire bait holders and you just lock your bait in on somewhere near the centre of the net, throw it overboard, out where I showed you in the video. And Bob's your uncle, I've never gone out there and not come home with a feed of spanner crabs. Although I haven't been out there for a while, I had dance the last time I was out there throwing these in spanner crabs, so that's been a good while. But, as I say, I've never gone out there and not had a feed, so I expect it'll do all right. There seems to be heaps of them around. I've spoken to Blake since then, and they say they're still around out there. So go and give it a go if you like a bit of... They're a different taste to your sandies and your muddies, sort of like sandies and muddies are a different flavour. Well, so are spanner crabs. Before we start going through the marks, I'll just spend a few minutes talking about the bathymetry in this area. And flashing up there is the main line of reef you want to be fishing. And that's where most everyone goes, somewhere along that line of reef going up there. Do make sure you avoid Flinders Rock and the associated green zone. But that line of reef runs all the way from Robert Shoal down in the south, all the way up through to Hutchinson's in the north. Standing along there, you're bound to find something. And then going a little bit further to the east, there's this more gradual drop-off, and that will become more apparent in some of the later shots with shaded bathymetry. But there's this more gradual drop-off, that has isolated patches of reef along it. It's well worth a look if you've got plenty of time. If you haven't got plenty of time or you're not in the mood to have a casual look around for new areas, stick to the main reef line and you'll find something up along it. There's also these couple of isolated bits of structure a little bit further out again. I'm not going to say too much about them now. I'm going to do a bit of a segment on them. Uh, probably going to take a few months down the track, but I'm going to do these specifically. So stay tuned for that one when it comes up. These shaded relief areas give a much better idea of what the bottom contours are like. I'm just flashing the marks up that we're going to talk about just to give you an idea of how they sit along these bottom contours. The other thing to notice is how much bottom contour is away from the marks. There's plenty of scope to find your own new marks. As always, the different colours used to show the bottom in the bathymetry maps highlights different things to me, so I like to go through all the available colours, just so I get a full understanding of what to expect out there. It's really good for helping to find new ground and cutting down on the time and fuel used to motor around out there trying to find it on your sounder. This at least gives you an area to look in and then once you get out there you've got a much smaller area to search. And now we'll have a look at some of the reef areas that have been surveyed out here. A lot of these don't have any marks on them so they're potential new ground. You've just got to explore it and find out what's down there on your sounder. But as I said, it's definitely surveyed reef in these areas. If you're not looking at this on a computer, you might need to zoom in a little bit on your phone because some of these marks are fairly small. They're, I think, probably spot surveys, which means there could be more reef around that's not on the survey. But this is from one survey. I'll bring up a slide from another survey in a second. And this slide is from a second survey that was done in this area. Bigger patches of reef this time, probably means it was a more extensive survey of the area. I hope that's what it means anyway. Take note of how it lines up with the other bathymetry maps I've been showing you, and add it to your arsenal of knowledge of this area 
to give you an idea of where to go looking for your new ground. Let's just talk for a minute about getting some live bait. If you're going up on the inside of Morton in the bay going up the shipping channel, I'd be stopping at the Beacons and looking for some bait along the way. If you go out through South Passage Bar and up the outside of Morton, then I've given you a couple of bait spots going out the South Passage Bar, one to the north, one to the south, and there's also this artificial reef here. Now, I've never fished it. It was only put there after I used to fish this area in Dancer, and I've never had any good reports on it. But it's an artificial reef, and I would expect bait to be there. So if you haven't got any bait, and you're going anywhere near there, I'd give it a scan for picking up some live bait on the way through. And also, don't forget that anywhere out on any of these reefs, you'd like to see bait balls go through. So keep your sabiki rod handy, and if you do see a bait ball go through, drop down on it. Or if you're looking around trying to find the fish and you see a bait ball, drop your sabiki down and grab some bait. Now the best bait is the bait that's in the area where the fish are because that's what they're feeding on. And one other thing before we get out into the marks proper and that is that there's a lot of coffee rock reef in close around Morton and here's some on the north side of Morton. If you can't get out to any of the deeper areas because of the weather there's always an option to fish in on these coffee rock reefs in close. I'm just showing you some of the coffee rock on the north end of Morton in this screenshot. I've already shown you some on the eastern side of Morton in earlier videos. And there's also some on the western side, which I hope to come back and cover in more detail once I get my new MFD in. I know I've only covered a couple of marks so far. I've given you the spanner crabbing spots. But the video is getting to the sort of length that I think is long enough for a YouTube video. So I'm not going to go through any more marks in this video. I'll just talk a little bit about the Cape Morton Lighthouse and the history of that. And then we'll cover the marks starting in the next video. If you've seen my earlier videos and you've listened to the little bit of history that's sprinkled through them, you'll know that when the Brisbane colony was first established, the South Passage Bar was the main entrance into Morton Bay. And that was used for a long time until accidents and loss of life eventually convinced them that they had to move it and make the main entrance around the northern tip of Morton Island. Of course, that has its own problems with Flinders Rock and Roberts Shoal and all the other rocks and shoals up in that area. Witness to that is the number of shipwrecks up there. But nevertheless, they made that the main entrance and it remains the main entrance for shipping to this day. I've spoken at length about the circumstances leading up to the move from South Passage Bar to the around the northern end of Morton in previous videos, so if you're interested, go and have a look at the videos on that area. But I'll just talk now about the lighthouse itself, and that was the first lighthouse that was established in Queensland. It was built by the Queensland Government in 1857. That was actually before Queensland separated from New South Wales, so I guess technically the New South Wales government built it back in those days. For a long time, the lighthouse was the only lighthouse on Queensland's 3,200 odd miles of coastline. Everyone talks about Fraser Island being the largest uh, sand island in the world, and that's true, but Morton Island is also mostly sand. The lighthouse itself is built on a rather rare rocky promontory on the northeast corner of the island. In 1915, the lighthouse passed from state government to federal government control. The height of the uh, lighthouse was increased in 1928 to 23 metres, which it is still at that height today. You can visit the lighthouse if you're over on Morton Island. The grounds to the lighthouse are open all year round. However, the tower is closed to the public. And that concludes today's history lesson. I've got a little bit of information on some of the wrecks that are out there. Not all of them, but a few. I'll share that with you as we go through the marks themselves. And that's it for this video. I thank you very much for watching. We didn't get to cover too many marks in this video because I gas bagged on about a whole lot of other stuff. But if you like spanner crabs, you will find all that information useful. 
and I will be covering the other marks in the future. I plan to do one of these videos a month now that I've got my boat back in the water. Hope, hopefully the weather will cooperate and I'll get out and do some more fishing videos and do one of these videos every month if I can until we've covered this area as well. And then probably I might do one or two quick videos on Jumping Pin and Gold Coast. I've done a few trips out of each going back a bit but I don't have as much experience in those areas as I do up in the northern end. But there might be something useful there for some people. Gold Coast is always worth a go. You don't go out there without coming home with something. As long as you can find a reef, that is. Anyway, that's in the future. Until then, good fishing.